I'm going to introduce Sarah Keane, President of the Olympic Federation of Ireland. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm actually logging in from the West, but still a very beautiful West Clare. Um, there's a couple of points that I'd like to share with you today in relation to my various experiences in this area, particularly within the wider Olympic movement. Um, I repeat, as I've said before, that this area is vast and it can therefore be quite overwhelming. And sometimes it's really difficult to know where to start. And so I suppose one of my big points will be to, to say to you that it's very important to individualize your journey, um, the journey of your organization, your area, whatever you're involved in, in relation to this. Um, and in terms of particularly of what you want to achieve. And the focus is primarily on women when we talk about gender balance, as in most cases, that's where the greatest inequality lies. However, it is also important to ensure that we do remember that it is about both genders. Um, so to take some points from a few of the groups I'm involved in internationally in relation to this area. So first of all, the International Olympic Committee. So gender balance is a key goal of the International Olympic Committee. And in 2018, they issued a full report in this area. But what I found particularly interesting in the last period of time are, are the following points. So firstly, Thomas Bach is the president of the International Olympic Committee. And he will demonstrate his commitment to this goal by ensuring that he attends and gives time out of his very, very busy calendar to go to um, events that are, are relevant to gender equality or are specifically related to gender equality to, show, to, I suppose, demonstrate leadership and the importance of the IOC, the importance of this goal to the IOC. He'll also ensure that when he's um, in most of his speeches that he references this topic um, and he makes uh, constant reference to the importance of it and also the various um, different elements and the progress of the IOC in relation to it. So what you're getting there is leadership from the very top saying that this is something that we value. This is something that we are holding ourselves responsible and accountable for. And for me, that's absolutely key in order to, to successfully look to implement a gender equality strategy within an organization. Within the IOC at first, what they started doing in relation to getting more women involved in committees and in commissions um, and across the leadership element of sport was really just to increase the number of people on the commissions. And I know World Rugby have done something similar. And this can be seen as quite a crude mechanism because you know you you know you do sometimes then question the effectiveness of a committee if you've gone from having five or eight people on it to suddenly having 15 people on it but the other side of this that is it can lead potentially to much more immediate change and then over time you can look to reducing the size of the committee so whilst originally i wouldn't really have been in favor of that i can see now that it has led to much uh, quicker change in relation to ensuring that women are involved in some of these decision making positions but where now they've moved to which again for me is a crucial point is in recognizing that it's not just about putting the women onto the commissions, but also ensuring that they have positions of power within the organization. So now within the Olympic movement, um, and in terms of the IOC commissions, you have almost equal numbers of female and male leaders in terms of the chairs of the commissions. You also now are seeing women on the IOC executive board, which is the highest level of leadership within the organization, and obviously on the IOC membership. And it's taken a bit more time to get there, and we don't have equal representation yet, but huge, pro huge progress has been made in this area in the last period of time. So again, it's that point about it's not just putting women on, it's also about ensuring that they are actually in positions of power within the decision making of the organization. There, there was also no clear leader within the IOC senior management team for whom gender equality was a clear and important part of their portfolio over the last year or two. And that meant really that the progress in relation to the 2018 report was starting to flounder a bit. But they've now addressed this, and for someone who's, uh, who's heavily involved with working with the IOC on this, I've seen huge uh, progress in the last year alone since they've now provided that portfolio to someone on their senior management team. So again, it goes back to the point that if you really are serious about this, it's ensuring that those at the highest levels of the organization are also accountable and responsible and involved in the area. They also recognize that the, two, the 25 recommendations that were in the 2018 review we're really starting maybe to be too many for people and for it to be seen to be too vast. So then now in their updated strategy, they're going to reduce that number. They're going to, to make it more focused to support people in terms of really what the areas they want them to focus on in relation to moving gender equality forward. And in relation to the, the IOC, before I move on to the ANOC, last but not least, if you're within the Olympic movement, you'll be aware that every four years around the time of the Olympic Games, there are elections in terms of the boards of the National Olympic Committees, the whole 206 of them. And some of those will continue to take place this year, despite the fact that the Games are not now postponed until next year, and some of them will, will wait until after the Games next year. But in the last month or two, Thomas Bach, the IOC president, has written out to all of the National Olympic Committees, reminding them 
of the fact that they have a target of 30% in terms of gender balance on their boards and asking NOCs to now start preparing for that in terms of their elections. So what they're doing is looking to be proactive rather than wait till after the elections are done, look at the numbers and see that maybe they aren't where they want to be. They're now telling people to take time to actually go looking for relevant candidates of obviously of the right skill set in terms of both female and male genders. The other organization that I'm a part of at, at, in relation to the international movement is ANOC, which is an organization that effectively represents the 206 National Olympic Committees at IOC level in various guises. And two points I'm going to make about this organization and what they've done in relation to gender equality. Firstly, the chair of the recently um, initiated uh, gender equality commission of this organization is, is a man, but he's a powerful male within the movement. He's just been recently elected to the IOC executive board. So again, it's showing and demonstrating that this has been valued at the highest levels. The other interesting piece for me was that he's from Jordan, which is a country that might necessarily come um, to your mind first in relation to best practice in the area of gender equality. But what I think it says is that nobody's off the hook, regardless of where you're from or what you're involved in or how many challenges there might be around it. Gender equality is something that everybody needs to address within the, the movement. The other important thing that they've done is in relation to all of the international federations that the Olympic movement works with have been surveyed in relation to what they're doing about gender equality. And they've all been then pulled together to examine the findings. And then individually, they've all been sent information about maybe their strengths, because obviously some of them are doing a good job, and then the areas of improvement. And now there's been continuous reports followed up so that they are accountable, and they're accountable publicly in relation to their progress in this area. That is now moving to the National Olympic Committee. So that survey was done at the end of last year. And now we're all being asked to look at what the situation is within our uh, different continents and in relation to individual NOCs. So really what that means is nobody's off the hook and you're getting individual feedback in relation to what's happening within your area. So again, I think this is important in terms of ensuring that we're all in this together. I also sit as the chair of the uh, European Olympic Committee Gender Equality Commission. And I just say a couple of things on this before I finish up. So when I stand in front of the European Olympic Committee General Assembly, I stand in front of pretty much of a room full of men. Um, maximum probably is about 15 percent women in the room. And there's a couple of things I've noticed about that. First of all, I noticed that if I start speaking about women in sport, I get a lot less attention than when I start speaking about gender equality. Trying to ensure that everybody feels part of not just the problem, but also the solution, and that we're in this together, I think is an important factor in terms of getting men and women together to champion gender equality. I also find that when I'm less critical of what's happening, but instead offering more solutions, that I, I feel that people are more willing to engage and to listen. So again, how you present your message is important in relation to and taking responsibility for that in terms of how it might be received by others. Also, in order to make real change, I really believe that it needs to be endorsed and supported at the highest levels. So the EOC executive board first endorsed the new EOC strategy in this area, then it was wholeheartedly adopted by the EOC General Assembly and now there have been changes made to the EOC constitution which now need to be operationalized. And change doesn't come easily. Um, and sometimes it's, um, it can be hard to do that. And it's important to reflect again on, on what appears, appears to be working in terms of how you're getting your message out and what doesn't, and to be willing to, to adjust that and take responsibility for the message you're delivering. So finally, I'll finish by saying, I'm delighted to be with you today. Um, and I feel very strongly that this matter of gender equality needs to be discussed and championed at the highest level of an organization. It needs to be a topic at the board and part of the overall company strategy in order for the highest level of decision making within the organization to be both accountable and responsible for delivering gender equality. Thank you for your time today and now I'll hand back to Ivan. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, we are going to discuss all of that later on. I particularly want to ask you more about that top down approach and um, how if it's not championed at the highest level, it's going to be much more difficult to implement. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on to Sarah O'Shea. Sarah is the Honorary General Secretary of the OFI and is also um, founder of SOS Sports Consult. And Sarah is going to take us through some of the more practical ways that we can actually think about um, implementing that theory on gender equality. So Sarah O'Shea, take it away. Great, thanks Ivan. It's always hard to come after Sarah Keane on, on gender equality. So um, I have developed a few slides, so I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, there we go, just take one minute. Okay, I think that's that's up there now. So what I wanted to talk about today really is, you know, how do we go about implementing gender equality 
and how do we actually achieve change within our organization um, and it's, it's actually not as easy as people think um, we all have in our NGBs all have rule books and constitutions so simply putting in a clause is, is never going to be the answer and um, so I just want to go through a few it's a whistle stop tour we can't go through everything in detail but a few thoughts and ideas which might get you started on, on, on the road but before we do that I just wanted to point out that it's very important for national governing bodies to understand the various perspectives out there. So gender equality should not be about women. It shouldn't be a women's issue within your sport. And it's absolutely crucial that we have men advocating for change in this area. And the research shows that men will respond better to other male peers who advocate, no matter how, how high up a woman is in this space, and it is important that we have male advocates and male leaders, and we have plenty of fantastic men working in sports. So uh, we really need the advocacy um, uh, from, from our male colleagues in this space. Um, also in terms of perspective, we'll often hear, you know, here we go again, gender equality, what about other diversity groups? And I just wanna make the point here that 52% of the population are women. So it's very important when you're messaging your own NGV to ensure that they're aware that while you know diversity and minority groups is very very important we all agree to have full diversity on the board um, but with 52 percent of the population being female gender equality has to be absolutely prioritized we all know from the um the great strategies out there at the moment and the media campaigns and 2020 etc you know seeing is believing and, and making women more visible is is absolutely very very important so where you have female leaders within your sport um, be they on committees, be they on, on the board, it's very important to make sure they're visible within the organization and that their journey is spoken about and they're out there encouraging other women um, to get more active and to step forward for board positions. And I am in this presentation significantly talking about women stepping into board and subcommittee positions, but mainly board positions. I want to mention the quotas. Um, there's a lot of debate around quotas. A lot of people agree with them. Some people don't agree with them. Personally, I flip-flopped myself over the years, uh, but I would be an advocate now more of the quota system. You will recall the minister in 2016 um, put out a survey to NGBs, and it's very interesting. If you go on the department website, you will see that there were 48 submissions made, predominantly by male leaders, because men, most men are in the chair and CEO position. But it's very, important, it's very interesting to read what they've said um, about not bringing in quotas. They felt the technical issues would be a barrier within their sport, so i.e., changing their constitution, representative seats in their rule book, and how would they go about that? So that's come across very loud and clear that that, that is something that we, we do need to look at. I've just put up a, a slide here, really, just to give you some high level stats. Um, government at the moment, the TDs were female, 22.5%. It was 22.2%, I think, in 2016. Corporate Ireland lagging behind there, um, maybe a little bit better this year, that, that figures from last year, so that's 18% Corporate Ireland board directors. Universities, good news this year, we had the first female president in 425 years um, since it was set up in 1592, I believe. So at the moment, though, 80% professorships are generally male. Um, as regards our own NGBs, our national governing bodies, Sport Ireland put some stats out at the beginning of this year. I think they were based on 2019 figures. The 29% of our boards are female. 24% of uh, chief executives are female in sport, 12% quite low there are chairs, and the last figure, 44%, that comes from a survey Lisa Clancy and I did on women in sport for Sport Ireland, uh, but we had that breakdown, so it's probably in and around that figure still at the moment. So what are the barriers? Um, you often hear the argument, well, you know, how do we get women to put themselves forward? You know, why don't they step up? Why don't they um, seek election, essentially? Um, well, the barriers here for women are vary. Um, again, in the consultation Lisa Clancy and I did in 2018 for Sport Ireland, these are the kind of barriers that kept, came up and they're consistent with international research. First one, confidence. And it's not that women don't have a confidence in their own ability or that they don't feel confident in a job. It's just that they're not sure what they have to offer. They like to be asked. They like to be invited to put themselves forward. So it's a slightly different way of thinking. And it's very important sports understand that. Tokenism, uh, am I being asked on this board just to take a box? Will I be the only woman on the board? Maybe there's too much politics on the board. Is there any point? People have been there a long time. Maybe there's, there's groupings. Um, 
do I know how to act on a board? You know, how to behave? Maybe I haven't been on a board before. And women particularly like to know detail before they go on board. So these are just some of the barriers that we've heard of. And what is the role I'm going to get? We, we see when women do go on boards, there's a, a lot of them um, end up in an honorary general secretary position, um, which is a great position, but some women may, may not want to do that role. They just want to be an ordinary board director. And what is the commitments um, with women, uh, barriers for women on boards generally in the corporate world, um, women are seen as having um, maybe time issues because they're generally uh, carers in the home or caring for the elderly, et cetera. So, those are the type of uh, themes that come up when you ask women about what the barriers are, um, particularly around um, sport as well. So we just look at two interesting pieces of research which solidify what I've just said. Um, so women all, will only apply for a job if they feel they're 100% uh, fitted to the criteria, whereas men will generally put themselves forward if they feel they meet just 60%. So that is some research done also by Hewitt Packard there, you'll see on the second point, women only apply for promotions when they meet 100% of the qualifications, as opposed to men who would apply the next 60%. Now, I know I'm generalizing here, but it is important within sport that we understand um, women are motivated differently. You know, they tend to like to be asked rather than putting themselves forward. So I think sports probably have a job to do in terms of the communication piece and the education piece around encouraging women to come forward. Also, another interesting piece of research, the Institute of Directors, um, in 2017, tone from the top, um, found that 42% of board members were approached by an existing board member and 67% of board, new board members knew up to three people on the board before joining. So with um, with majority of men on boards, that in itself can cause issues in terms of, you know, the subconscious barriers to recruiting um, women. Um, because, uh, you know, you tend to look for people within your own network. So if the board is predominantly male, and if there's a vacancy, often the directors will, will, will seek out a, a, a colleague. And um, often that's why women sometimes don't get the tap on the shoulder. So it's just another piece of interesting research, I think, anyway. As regards what can we do in our sports? Well, first of all, make gender equality an agenda item. So really, we need to get it at the board table. As Sarah Keane said, it's really important to put this as a priority item. We need to understand what's our over, overall aim and strategy within our particular sport. Uh, there is no one size fits all. So do we want 50%? Do we want 40% on our board? Do we want 30%? And what's our timeline? Are we able to do it this year? Do we do it next year? Is it a three-year plan or a five-year plan? So every sport has to think about that. Um, if you haven't already got a governance committee, you should set one up anyway for the Code of Good Governance. And the issue around gender equality and bringing more females onto boards should be an agenda item on that governance committee. Or equally, equally, it can be on an equality committee agenda, or you can set up a special working group. The first thing to do, though, is review your current board structure. Do up a matrix. See how many positions in your board are elected. See how many positions are nominated, appointed, co-opted, or independent. So if you have a board of 10 and you have six elected, well, you need to work out also what's the terms of office of those individuals. So put together a matrix. There can be opportunities that arise around terms of office. If there are two people stepping down, for example, in 2021, well, then maybe you now know you have a window of opportunity to maybe change the rules. And if you don't have co-opted people or appointed people, maybe those positions can be put forward for um, a nominations committee instead of going through the elective process. But every sport will be different, and that's the key message from this. And um, it is important to do a separate strategy for each board type. So the strategy on increasing female representation through the elected and um, system will be very different through the nominated, co-opted and representative system. Very important also to take out your constitution, literally with a highlighter and highlight everywhere where you see any reference to board structure, because your constitution would have to be updated to, to take account of this. Also importantly is to brief the membership. You don't go to the membership with a, with a suggested rule changes. Really, you need to brief them that this is a journey we're going on. And by 2024, maybe we'll have 30, 40, 50 percent women on the board. And this is how we're going to go about it. And invite the membership to come in and to offer some suggestions and solutions as well. So just back to elections. I mean, these are the different strands every sport will have. I can't emphasize enough with elections. You've got to think them right through to the end from the very moment of putting out expressions of interest to an election policy, to how the ballot would run. Um, on the day, etc. So there's a very few different approaches. So the first thing is 
can our sport provide for minimum gender um, balance in our particular sport in our constitution? Some sports will be able to do this easier than others. And um, so it's just to ask yourself that question, do we think it's possible? Will our membership go with this? And if it is possible, then you need to go to your constitution, put in a particular clause, and have a look to see, can you also put in a mandatory clause around, well, with four officers, at least one or two must be female, or if we have six ordinary elected positions, then how many do we want as, as female elected positions coming through? And um, also take a look at your voting system. So on the day of a ballot, the ballots may have to be done separately, and you have to waterfall the election process. So if the first three seats are filled by men, well, the fourth seat maybe then will have to be withheld for the female candidates. But what's very important is to be fair and to make sure your policy is sent out to your members in advance. So if I um, lose out on a seat because of a gender quota, then I should have been advised of that in advance that that may happen. Um, so that's very important. If, the, if you can't change your minimum, your, put in a quota clause because of your particular sport, then at least encourage when you're asking people to put themselves forward for election that um, the membership uh, encourage female candidates. And that's an education communication piece on behalf of the, the NGBs. Um, most sports will have positions on the board that are non-elected. So they're basically coming from representation from maybe disciplines within the sport, or maybe it's geographical. So for example, Connacht can put two people on a, a board or Leinster, Ulster, Munster, et cetera. Um, if there's two nominees being put forward, you could think about stipulating from here on that one must be a female. That's one idea. If it's only one nominee, well, then you could still write to your representative bodies and ask them that when they're considering nominations, that they do consider gender equality and maybe they would consider reflecting that. It's not forcing their arm, but it's just asking them to think about it. Um, so that is another piece of advice I think we need to look at. As regards co-options, independence and appointments, a lot of sports now have between you know, one and three maybe independents or co-opted positions on their boards. Some, some have zero at the moment and others are working on that. Um, it's a really good mechanism to bring women on your board if they don't naturally come through the election process or the representation nomination process. Um, very important to uh, use this as a, as a, it has to, should be skill set based, obviously, but gender equality should be right up there as well if, if women don't come through in the other mechanisms. Um, again, very important that you have a nominations committee within your sport for all positions. Um, I would be proposing for a nominations committee in this area as well, if you're looking at gender equality, is that there's 50% men and 50% women on that nominations committee. And they should really set out the criteria. They can set out their criteria for elections as well around the type of individuals that you want on your board and the commitment that's needed and to make sure they understand corporate governance and also around uh, gender equality and skill sets. And um, that nominations committee can be very useful to prepare a communication to the members. They can also examine any applications they come in. And very importantly here, it's the timing of appointments. The nominations committee really should do a timetable to see, you know, when should we look for nominated positions? Should we wait till after we see who comes through the elected process? Um, and hold back the appointments process until the elected and nominations process has, has happened to allow for balancing if that's required. As always, nominations committee should be independent and be transparent and open. So um, we're always here to help in uh, Team Ireland and I'm always here to help as well. So thanks very much for your time. Um, and I will hand back to Ivan. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, I am, yes, I'm unmuted. Um, that, that was brilliant, Sarah. I've taken loads of notes and I have a lot of questions and I'm sure we're going to get a good few in in the Q&A box as well. So um, we revisit a lot of that um, after the next presentation. Uh, so I'm delighted to say that Professor Neve Brennan is with us. Now Neve is the founder and corporate, or the founder and academic director of the UCD Centre for Corporate Governance. And Neve is going to do a presentation as well, I believe. So um, Neve, you take it away and we have your slides ready to go. Thanks very much, Yvonne. I'm actually not going to do a presentation. Um, I'm just going to make a few observations. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Olympic Federation of Ireland for inviting me to speak and to all the people that are attending um, this webinar. Um, I'm thank you also, Ivan, for mentioning my Centre for Corporate Governance. I set it up in 2002 
and uh, its purpose is to provide training to company directors. At that time, a lot of people didn't appreciate the relevance of it, uh, but they do now. So I offer courses to company directors um, out of this Murford School. And I'd like to say uh, in this ad break that we're open for business and uh, we will be delivering the lectures face to face uh, this coming semester. Governance. What, what, what do we mean by governance? So let me go back to basics and tell you where the word comes from. And it comes from a Latin word called gubernare. And the word is used in a Cicero poem. He that sits quietly at the stern and scarce is seen to stir. So you're sitting quietly at the stern providing your organization with direction. Thus, it's a board of directors um, directing the organization. Um, a board of directors also oversees management and then provides support to the organization and um, wise counsel. But that word gobernare and the Cicero quote is why nautical metaphors frequently uh, appear um, in relation to uh, governance. And um, I'm, my specialty is corporate governance, although governance of organizations that are, aren't incorporated would be quite similar. And I say to my classes, what is the purpose of a corporation? What's the purpose of a company? And happily, students blurt out the wrong answer. They say things like, for example, the purpose of a company is to make money. Where does that leave not-for-profits? So that's obviously not the right answer. And the correct answer is that the reason why uh, people form a company is to take advantage of limited liability, which means that if things go wrong, um, you, you cannot get behind the company to get at the individual entrepreneurs, we'd say, who set up the company. And because um, a company's objective is to provide entrepreneurs with limited liability, it then follows that the number one purpose of a company, is, or sorry, the number one purpose of a board of directors is risk management because the company is taking risks and those risks have to be managed. And um, a company called Wirecard, a German payment processing company called Wirecard, collapsed um, on the 25th of June. It was a huge news story, business news story. Um, Two billion turned, cash turned out not to exist. The company's market capitalization the week before was 17 billion and a week later it was zero. And you have to ask yourself, how could something like that happen? Uh, and the fraud had been going on for 10 years. The auditors had given a clean bill of health on the accounts. And when I read that the chief executive, Marcus Brown, described himself as pathologically optimistic I immediately knew what happened. No risk management there with the chief executive who is pathologically uh, optimistic. And um, corporate governance consists of a complex machinery of moving uh, parts. And the strange thing about corporate collapses like Wirecard is the extent to which the mechanisms all fail at the one time. Corporate governance is highly regulated by legislation, corporate governance codes, etc. But what I find interesting about corporate governance is that it comes down to people, uh, human behavior, and things go wrong when human behavior goes wrong. Um, so it's the human side of things. And that then brings us on to the diversity question, which is 
about the human beings that are around the boardroom table. And I like to think of diversity um, of obviously in terms of gender. Um, and the reason why gender has come onto the corporate governance agenda is because women are seen to be more risk averse than men. Um, and that's why there's an appreciation of having women in senior roles. And we can see that playing out with COVID. So for example, um, female prime ministers like Angela Merkel and Jacinta Ardern in New Zealand, they are being fated for how well they have handled COVID. Unlike some other countries um, on either side of us with male prime ministers who have had uh, a, a, not had that prudent risk appetite. Um, but it isn't just simple as just the gender diversity, uh, ethnicity is relevant as well. But I actually, again, coming back to human behavior, like to think of it in terms of how you think are you independent minded? Are you willing to take a stance on a board? Um, and so in corporate governance, words like dissenters, contrarians, devil's advocates are um, valued uh, in, in boardrooms. I'm going to finish off these two, uh, these, these few words with two anecdotes capturing the human element around the boardroom table. The first anecdote comes from a former chief executive male of a large Irish listed company, and he's now a non-executive director. And I heard him say at a conference, we don't want anyone with sharp elbows around the boardroom table. What he means is he wants the boardroom to be a comfortable, cozy club for him and his friends. And that is one of the reasons why corporate governance goes wrong. And a second anecdote that I'm going to finish on is a female non-executive director who is asking all of the right questions around the boardroom table. And the chairman man of the board said to her, you know, you need to get help with your communication problems. You need to go to car communications. Her communication problems were that she was asking all of the right questions and the chairman wanted her to back off because they were up to no good. They were so badly up to no good that the, the organization no longer exists. It collapsed in a corporate governance debacle. Um, so there are my few words on the human element of corporate governance. Thanks for listening to me. Neve, thanks so much. Um, thank you for that. Sorry, my delay there on muting myself. Um, that's all fascinating, and it's all um, it's all quite it's all quite academic. It's all it's relatively heavy as well. So it's good to have be able to tease some of that out now in in a more in a wider panel discussion. Um, I'm delighted that Dr. Jennifer Cassidy is online. I see you there, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to um, ask everybody on the panel to unmute themselves. Um, I think isn't that the plan? Yeah. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourselves. Your video should be in action. So if we, I think Mary is going to put us on gallery view so we can see each other. Um, Jennifer, I'll start with you because we haven't heard from you yet. Um, thanks for joining us. We're very appreciative. Um, your reaction to what you've heard uh, so far, I mean, I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of notes taken here around, um, you know, the, the, the providing direction and the stuff around quotas and targets. Um, but your initial reaction to what you've heard from the three, the three speakers so far. But it was wonderful, and I was just, um, you know, making notes and, and uh, alongside and saying, well, first of all, let me say, uh, as I said last week, thank you so much for having me last week. And again, this week, I really appreciate um, being involved in this sport is not, I'm not the most athletic person in the world, but it is <laughs> equality and equity is something I'm extremely passionate about. So thank you for having me. Um, um, regarding my impressions, yes, the all the presentations were uh, distinct, diverse, and, and so on, on point. Uh, particularly, I, well, I'll, I'll first note the, what you brought up, the, the quotas, and it struck me because that's exactly what I think. When someone says to me about quotas, one day I say, I'm with them, 
I have every argument for the quotas. And then the next day someone says, I'm like, no, nope, I'm not for them at all. I cannot. And I have been, you know, having published books on gender and like my, my speciality is technology and diplomacy. Um, but uh, um, gender and diplomacy has become one of my passions. But uh, having published on gender and diplomacy, I still can't, I still can't decide whether I want quotas or not. Now, if I'm pushed, I will say for, for quotas, but I, of course, I want there to become a time when we don't need quotas, right? That's the end goal. The end goal is to create enough momentum that ultimately quotas do not have to exist. But I very much um, align with Sarah's point there that it's hard to as both as an academic and, and as a practitioner you know i have worked in diplomacy beforehand as a diplomat it's hard to align yourself you see it from the academic point so that's one uh point and then particularly regarding yeah i couldn't i couldn't agree more with um uh, professor brennan's uh views on governance uh of, of course, um, uh, Professor Renan works in, in corporate governments. Uh, I lecture in global governance, and as and um, as we as we know, governance is is hard enough to define, and and it's very interesting the anecdote that you gave about your students about the the corporate aspect, but regarding global governance itself and how we how we seek to use that on an international level regarding equity and uh, equality in sports, um, it, it's difficult. So it's difficult to 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 pin down. That would be more for a. Uh, supernatural or, or, um, organization. So I know that's very broad answers to, to questions, but I can speak to more directed um, questions if you. I presume we're all um, of the same mind in that governance, sports governance is, is obviously it's to do with sports, but governance, good governance, full stop. Um, Jennifer, you're saying you're not, you know, you're not into sport necessarily, and I know, um, like Neve, you will. Well, I am into it. I am into it. I just don't have the ability. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Likewise. Um, but my point is that it, if, 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 if it's not just about sport, Neve. I presume you would argue that good governance is good governance, regardless of whether you're in in the world of business or in the world of sport. Exactly. Correct. Um, and um, even even if you just. Uh, Governance varies depending on the organization and the um, sector uh, that it's in. So it all, governance has all kinds of little differentiating details. But for myself, I have just a simple uh, test for myself. I don't need to look at the rule books. I don't need to look at codes. I don't need to look at laws. For myself, um, my standard is, does it pass the front page of the Irish Times test? It's really simple. Uh, and that will, uh, that, that standard, I think, uh, keeps you clear on the side of right and otherwise. Yes, and if I could just jump in there, I would say one point that I made just uh, last week on, on leadership, and it was brought up today again regarding the leadership that we've seen in, in COVID um, and the, the highlighting of Jacinda Ardern, Taiwan, Germany. And I made the point of this, there, uh, we do not in any way wish to dilute the amazing work that these female leaders have done during the, the, this time of COVID. That is, I, that is not my aim here at all. But actually, when you look at the countries that have female leadership, Sweden, the prime minister we have at 34, and that has 10% fewer deaths than their, than, than their neighbors. Actually, the female leadership is just one variable, and this would tie into governance. It's just one simple, not simple, but the leadership is one variable of a whole system of governance. What we have seen is that these leaders did not emerge in a vacuum. These prominent, strong, female leaders, be they female or not, they have emerged from healthy societies. They've emerged from a structure which allowed 
strong, independent, and also strong representation around them for collaboration, for relationship building. So actually there's a lot of different variables at play in these countries where the female leaderships have succeeded very successfully in COVID. And then if you look at, pardon that, that um, noise and um, if you look at as we said the other side of the water which thankfully i'm back here for the uh, back in ireland at the moment <laughs> but if we look at the other side of the waters yes we are seeing and i i will say this pretty horrendous leadership from from male leadership but look at the societies look at the overall governance structures that they are coming from they are not coming from healthy structures they are not coming from global strong you know Gulliver, if i could just make one small anecdote and then i will give way do you know um uh gulliver's travels yeah Yes, so Joseph Nye, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but he is, uh, the, the, his, he was the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, and the quote is, all roads, of Amer all roads of understanding American foreign policy lead towards Joseph Nye, so that would show the standard of him. But I had the privilege of having lunch with him last year, and he gave me, I asked him, did he think Trump was going to win n next year? And he gave me the example of governance and said, about what Trump thinks about governance and about the US. And he said that he sees the US as one big giant, as giant, the Gulliver's Travels, and all the little ties on the island are all the institutions dragging the US down. And he wants to cut what he's doing with the Paris Climate Accord, the WHO, anything to tie the governance together. And he believes that if he cuts them off, America will be free. But that's not what we're, that's not the world we live in. We need, and that's why we're seeing the successful leadership, collaboration, transparency, working together. And so I think just to, to note that there are a lot of variables at play in global, in not, not just global governance, but governance in general. If that's that little anecdote there, sorry. I went on a little uh, tangent. Of I, course, know. Anna, just to say something yeah. on, on sports governance in particular, I think one of the important points, the unique pieces on sport is, you know, the, the board positions have seen to be a reward for people volunteering over X number of years. And that's very unique to sport. It's, it's very mm -hmm. different to the corporate side of things. And I think it's really important that we in sport, and we're doing it really well now, is move away from the board as seeing as a reward system. Um, I mean, we all know in sport, it, sport is full of politics, you know, and you're promised a seat on a board four or five years before you get it, if you, if you stay in the sport, etc. So th they're the kind of barriers that are in sport. So when you talk about gender equality, um, somebody has to give up a seat is the thinking to allow more women on a particular board. And that is an issue within sports specifically that uh, we are addressing, but um, I think it's one, one unique thing about sports governance particularly. Yeah, I, I add here is, sorry. I was, no, just going, I was just going to add in relation to that, that some of the times people don't understand where decisions are made across an organization. And they think if they want to be part of decision-making, they need to be on the board to do it. And if people have a better understanding of the system of decision-making through an organization, then they're better, they, they sometimes better understand where they fit within the organization and they're prepared maybe to see that the board mightn't be the right place for them somewhere else is. So it's about saying to everybody, there's a place for everybody within our sport, everybody, uh, whoever you are. Um, and even if you're asked you know, to spend a t certain time maybe on, you know, in a position, because we do believe that you should move on from a particular position after a period of time, it doesn't mean you're asked to leave the sport. You're just maybe asked to go into a different direction or a different position or, or, or make a contribution in a different way. So I think, I, I think my experience is that a lot of time people don't understand where the decisions are made and they feel they have to be on the board, for example, or a, a, at a particular um, place to be part of those decisions. So if people understand better, so therefore when we're sending out information about what committee, you know, about committees or we're sending out information about working groups, that so we explain what they do and what decisions they're, they're able to make versus what decisions the board make. Um, and this does obviously differ depending on the size of the organization as well in terms of the strategy versus the operational, et cetera. But I've often found in my experience that a lot, you know, 
almost everyone I've met who are involved in sports want to contribute positively to the sport, want to give something positive because they feel strongly about it and they recognize what it does for people. But sometimes what they don't understand is where their contribution can best be served. And it's explaining and taking the time to, to do work that through with people often has, has, has the best results. And I think in gender equality, it's the same, it's the same piece. And I, you know, I, I really strongly believe that there needs to be a strategy around gender equality, a strategy that's approved at board level, looking at both genders, even if, as we say, we talk a lot more about women because of the fact that, uh, you know, from everything we can see at the moment, they're the ones who are least served in terms of being, you know, being equal in this regard. And one of the reasons as well, like we have a lot more women on this particular series at the moment um, is to highlight and profile some more of the women that are involved in um, both here and abroad who have something to offer to this conversation. But it doesn't mean men are excluded. And the next time we do something, we probably have more men involved. So it's, it is very much a collaboration between everybody. But it's a lot to do with people, going back to Neve's point and, and the point Jennifer and Sarah made, it's a lot to do with people and understanding people and saying everyone has a contribution to make and be involved in decision making, but you need to do it at the right place and at the right side, part of the organization. That's why I'm asking, you know, you, you, you talked, Sarah, about um, the importance of, you know, um, you mentioned uh, Thomas Bach and just the fact that he was mentioning gender equality in all of his speeches. It was a really targeted agenda that he was putting out there. So um, the importance of leadership and just top down when it comes to gender equality. So if we drill down into that a little bit more, um, if you are in an organization, we have 102 participants here today. And if they are in an organization and they would like to paddle that agenda of gender equality and maybe it doesn't exist at all or they're really trying to get off the ground with it if you don't have a leader or a set of leaders in the organization that are really aware of or um, have any time for for promoting that message of gender equality practically speaking Sarah Keane how how does one go about that if you're simply you know if you're at if you're not at board level if you're not at leadership level in the organization how do you take any kind of um, responsibility for starting that conversation well, I'll take, take Thomas back, for example, um, like Thomas back is up for uh, going forward for election next year. He's not going to campaign um, which, on gender equality. It's not going to be one of his main, when he puts out his manifesto for election, I doubt gender equality will be referenced in it because it's, it's, not, it's not something that he's going to champion and see as one of the things that are most fundamental to the movement and in terms of how the movement progresses. So asking him to do that um, in that particular circumstance probably isn't the right thing to do. But if you're understanding where he views it and how he will help, I think is an important piece around it. So in terms of where you are in an organization, you're always associated with somebody or you're always part of something in your organization. So it's understanding where the people you are working with are associated with, how they can influence everywhere else. And it, you don't have to change the world in one go either. You know, from a point of view, it's often about doing, you know, recognizing that there's something that you can do with that's within your control. And even it's often about really just bringing something to somebody's attention. I find a huge amount of the time, and I do it myself as well, it goes back to this unconscious bias piece that we talked about before, where people just don't even realize they're not doing it or they're not being inclusive or they haven't considered something. Um, and it also goes back to the big point around the fact that women, women do generally need to be encouraged more than men. They generally, mentors work really, really well for women and uh, be you male or female if you can support another woman and encourage someone to put themselves forward for something. Because at the moment in the Olympic movement, there's 13% of, out of the 206 National Olympic Committees, only 13% of the chairs are female. But only 14% of women put themselves forward for election the last time. So you can't therefore expect the numbers to be greater if they're not going forward for election. So I suppose, to back to your original point, I, I do believe in trying to influence all the way up, but it's also understanding where, where, where someone sits on something and listening to that, and then trying to hear how, trying to understand how best they will hear you. How so, best will they hear you? Sarah O'Shea, we have a question in for you, actually, specifically around um, NGBs who've actually successfully put those measures in place to improve gender equality on their boards. So. Um, you know, do you have any examples of the any of the federations here at home who have, you know, struggled with gender equality and managed to implement some sort of change? Well, I'm going to have to back this to my colleague Sarah King. Swim Ireland have just done it, I understand. Um, and anyway, in the Olympic Federation, we hope to do it in September as well. And um, it was quite technical from a constitutional point of view. How so to you, go about to, that. you had to well, it be passed, yes, but we, we hope it will be. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's complicated, though, isn't it? And both Neve and Jennifer kind of touched on it as well around the constitution. Um, Neve, you might you might even explore that a little bit for us. You know, if a constitution doesn't allow for, you know, a gender quota or any kind of balance on the boards, um, is there like an easy five step, you know, um, to break it down for people here who might have a full understanding of constitutional law, but um, 
the OFI have had to go back and, you know, they're hoping to implement that at their next AGM. Um, changing constitutions is very, very bureaucratic um, and difficult to do. So I would say to organisations that are planning to change a constitution, to make sure that you change everything that you want to change and that you're not coming back again looking for members to vote another change in the constitution. Because I imagine that um, diversity and gender issues are just one of a number of uh, aspects of constitutions that may need to be modernised. Can, can I just add there, Neve's absolutely right about that, but uh, the, the current code of governance which all governing bodies have been asked to adhere to, all sporting governing bodies in Ireland have been asked to adhere to, um, I, I don't know if it's by next year, um, does deal with a lot of that modernising pieces around, um, you know, getting their boards and, and other parts of the organisation, the structure um, in good position. But I suppose for me, one of the frustrating pieces is that the governance code is silent in terms of diversity and, and gender on the boards, particularly around gender. It's, it's, it's so in a way, I feel that it kind of lets organisations off the hook around this. So it's, it's one of the reasons I suppose, suppose we wanted to do this and appeal to people to say that when you're, you know, when you're looking at that list and when you're going through all those principles in terms of what good governance looks like, if, if diversity and gender isn't mentioned specifically, please don't leave them out. Don't leave them out of what you're looking to do when you're making the changes. Um, and the fact also that, you know, every organization is different. And as, as Sarah O'Shea said in her piece, all, you know, how different organizations are constituted and on their board and other committees are all different, but it doesn't mean you can't find a way to get more diversity onto those committees on the board. So ultimately you have better decision-making. Sarah O'Shea, is it hard to balance that um, responsibility between policy on gender quotas, for example, or targets and fairness. I mean, it's come up a few times, you know, around interviews or, you know, board members or um, even on another level entirely, like I'm working in, in sports journalism and we have in RTE, um, we have promised to increase our women in sport coverage, for example. And, you know, sometimes there is an, an argument or there's an editorial um, discussion around, you know, what will get into a certain bulletin ahead of something else. So balancing the, the, the between the fairness um, or the justification and then your, your new policy, your quotas, your targets, um, that's a difficult balance to reach across the board, I would, I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, they say if you want to run for politics in Ireland, you should start with sports politics. <laughs> so um, it is a, it's a nest politics and sport and anyone who, who's in sport will know that every every sport has a different set of issues different politics different controls different power struggles etc so um, it, I'm, I'm not going to say it's easy but as Sarah Keane said there is a solution but you do have to have a plan and have an implementation plan to work it out every sport is going to have a different set of circumstances they have to deal with so I can't stress enough though that um, our NGBs are made up of fantastic volunteers. And even if you know there are not people on the board who have the time or the capacity or the ability to do this, putting a working group together on this point to have your sport, look at the issue, you know, um, try and get some of your volunteers together who have an interest in this area and may be able to help the board with this is one suggestion if the board are not able to do it. But ultimately, it's back to leadership at the top and um, you know it's about communicating with the members this like this is something that's important and um, you know we we want to bring in gender equality to our organization and here's our three-year plan how we're going to do it here's our five-year plan talk to the membership of the agms tell them you're going to set up a working group if anybody wants to come on board consultation is really really important here because there will be toes stepped on when people lose seats board at board level so it's really important to bring the membership with you on the journey I couldn't stress that enough that would be my advice. Jennifer Sarah mentioned earlier about male advocacy and you know that gender equality isn't just about women um, would you would you go along with that even outside of sports circles? Oh certainly and and, and last week I was, I was speaking about mentorship and you know 10 years ago if you had have talked around this I think I would have been you know a bit more Feisty is the wrong word, but I think I would have been a lot less willing to listen um, and not engage. But I 
as time has gone on, I've realized that, you know, a lot of people, we need to give them the, ch as you've already alluded to, some people just don't have the environment at the moment where this uh, gender equality is at the focus of their organization or even, you know, a small aspect of it. You know, so to, to demonize or to even criticize from, from off the bat people who, you know, have not been socialized or even been exposed to um, events like this is not the way to go about it. So I certainly, in the last few years, when I, I do, I speak a lot at the UN and the EU, and I actively seek to create a, a collaborative environment between men and women and not um, a divisive one. And this links to one of the policy recommendations that I um, note when seeking to achieve gender equality and if people are listening and if they wish to um, you know, even start something. The mentorship program doesn't just have to be between women and women to women and saying yes women need to push forward i myself have needed the push forward saying and i've said i can't go for that job you know i won't get this and someone's and you know someone said no you know apply first but also mentorship between men and and women so we in, in creating this inclusive environment creating this collab collaborative environment and not creating this segregated men versus women if we are to reconstruct i speak about the gender of diplomacy i don't speak about gender and diplomacy or the gender of politics we can speak about the gender of sports and that means that it is we don't take the participation of men in sport for granted but rather we seek to see how masculine norms and values have shaped sports and have shaped the governing bodies of sports so it's not actually talking about the men men themselves and segregating them it's actually looking about how these masculine norms and values in societies have shaped them so i'm very much for an inclusive environment because if we if we are going to make a change we certainly cannot demonize and certainly we cannot demonize people who just simply have not been exposed to this before there's been many issues we've seen them globally happening around the world at the moment that we are all having to take stock of we're all having to reflect on our role in it we're looking at the black lives um matter movement i've just i've reflected on it as well and you know we need to reflect on this educate on this and this is the same thing for gender in sports gender in politics and gender in diplomacy so i don't think you know, demonizing people, I think educating, bringing them along and actually showing steps, uh, concrete and comprehensive steps that will allow a comprehensive change uh, to exist and hopefully gender equality and equity to be a key role, be it in sports, politics, diplomacy, whatever avenue we're looking at. Can I come in there, Ivan, just for a second, just in relation to, um, like there was a program, the EOC, did it through our gender equality um, in relation to new leaders. And it was it was looking to, I suppose, influence thinking of people who are young and will be the leaders of the future. And it was a group of, um, there was there was 30 people from 25 European nations who, who were involved. And it, the decision was it would be 15 men and 15 women who were involved in the program. And they all were given mentors and it was agreed that the men would be mentored by female by females and the, the 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 women would be mentored by men. So again, just it just goes back to the whole collaborative yeah. piece. That that has worked out incredibly well because a lot of the way these guys think now is just naturally uh, men and women collaborative, who's got the skill set, who can help with this, who can make the right decision as opposed to thinking about the gender piece. But just I just want to also say if if I look around Irish sport at the moment in terms of women in sport and um, you know sport aren't of put a huge investment from you know with the government and the department of sport into the area of women's sport i think and, I, and i'm open to correction here but my understanding is there's not one male lead in terms of of the women's sport leads across all of the governing bodies they're all women um and uh, you know i think that says something in terms of you know the, the individuals who are looking to work in this area and, and promote this area and it's another reason why we do also need the men champions the male champions but i suppose my other question and i suppose it's my 
challenge out to governing bodies is at what level um, in the organization are these individuals? Are they on the senior management team? And if not, do they have access to the senior management team and do they have access to the board to ensure that the issue of gender equality is part of the overall strategy and it's being discussed at the highest levels of the organization? Um, I think that's something that we, we, you know, we do all need to think about um, in Ireland, particularly in Ireland as we move forward. Just want to ask one more question before we go because we got it in. I don't want to. I don't want anyone to think that we're ignoring their questions. But um, this is probably a question for one of the Sarahs. Um, so pathological pathological optimism. Um, it could be seen as desirable, if not essential, in the 364 days in the shadow that lead to the one sporting success day. So um, is sport therefore at greater risk of not paying enough heed to risk? Um, now, Neve mentioned risk averse earlier and the fact that women are maybe more risk averse, but is sport at greater risk of not paying enough heed to that risk? Well, I wouldn't have thought so at all personally, because to me, uh, I mean, you know, any, any functioning corporate governance system will have a whole risk management plan in it. It's something that will be looked at on an ongoing and a regular basis across, you know, whether it's your, your committees, whether it's your staffing structure or whether it's your board. So um, for me, the risk is just an, it's, it's an ongoing part of your day-to-day -day work, um, both at operational and strategic level. So, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of, you could say there's a risk in terms of an event not going ahead. Um, and this particular event, uh, we have, you know, the, the, the summer and winter Olympics being the sort of two more senior events only every, every two years. So is there a risk to the organization as a result of that? Well, look, that's part of the way the Olympics work. There are other events that, that are associated with the Olympic movement that certainly we at the OFI have been um, looking to promote as part of the pathway and as we move forward. Um, but I think, again, you, you know that's the risk. So you have to build in your, your risk management measures around that. Okay. Add in there, Ivan, for me as well, just as well. Yeah, I mean, risk analysis and risk registers, I mean, they have, they're at the core now of any sports national governing body. You just, you just have to have it and you have to do it. Um, and it comes back to who's on the board and having the right skills because if you've got people on the board who understand um, risks and controls and what a board needs to be doing, um, they, can, they can red flag these issues. So, um, but it's, we're not more exposed in sport to risk, but I, I think it's important to have the right people on the board who can um, see maybe where there might be risk. And I'm sure with Neve's uh, courses, there's a huge, huge uh, emphasis on the whole area of risk. And I'm sure Jennifer looks at it as well. So it's something that's very top of the. Okay. Um, before we wrap up, just for the people who are um, very kindly waiting and listening and, um, you know, hanging on your every word, I want to ask all four of you for your, your biggest take home to, for people to take home from this. Um, if it's a small little um, direction in the in the way of gender equality in their organization. So I'll start with you, Neve, if you wouldn't mind, just the biggest thing that people should maybe take from this if they're involved in an organization. Um, well, I have six words to answer that question. And the six words is are, if it is to be, it's up to me. You know, we all have to take responsibility for moving on, moving this agenda forward take personal responsibility and not be sitting around waiting for other people to do it. Absolutely. That was part of the, that was part of my question for Sarah earlier around, you know, leadership from the top down and, um, but actually from the bottom up as well is something that we need to be looking at when it comes to gender equality. Thank you, Neve. And um, Jennifer, your biggest take home to give to people from this, uh, from this discussion. Um, well, if I could borrow it from last week, I didn't bring it up here, but it's something that I think uh, if panelists, uh, um, if sorry, participants weren't um, he, listening last week, I think it's very important to note that if we're looking at governance boards, the issue of numbers versus substance. So in my research, I'm, I, alongside the question, how many women are there, which is a question that I do not dismiss. I think we need to keep highlighted and keep a spotlight on it. But I think we also need a new spotlight and that spotlight is where are the women? And so you, you, you've touched on it a bit in, in sports journalism and we touched on it, doesn't make the front page of the, the, the Irish Times. And so, how many women? Yes, a company can come back to you, foreign affairs come back and say we 50% intake. But if you look at the ambassadorial level, you'll notice that women are not getting positions of, uh, they're not getting New York, they're not getting Geneva, they're not getting Paris, they're not getting the top policy making posts. So along with the numbers, along with actually saying 
check, check, check. We have this many women. We'd also say the next spotlights go like this, but spotlights go, <laughs> so we also look at the spotlight saying, where are the women? What positions are they getting? So yeah. numbers and persons, that's it. Absolutely, yeah. And actually, Sarah, you said that at the start as well, Sarah Keane, about uh, not just the positions, but the power in those positions. And that, that, that where the, that's where the women need to be as well. Um, Sarah O'Shea, I'll ask you for your, um, your final thoughts for people to take away. Thank you, Jennifer, by the way. Um, Sarah O'Shea, what would you like people to take away from this? Um, I suppose there's far more learned people out there who know the theory of um, governance. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I like the practical implementation side of it. So I think um, for me, it's the two Ps. Have a political plan. And I mean, that's sports political about your membership. To try and get buy-in. And there's different practices there in different sports of all different politics. So a political plan, number one. And second, a practical implementation plan which includes you know, working groups, how you're going to change your constitution, your timeline, uh, your matrix, looking at your board matrix and all that. So the two Ps, politics and practical implementation. Politics, practical, and say Roche on speed dial for SOS Sports Consult if you need help with it all. Um, okay, I'll give the final word to uh, Sarah Keane, president of the OFI. Sarah, um, you know, this series has gone really well so far. There's only one more week of it. So, but for today, um, in dealing with gender equality and sport governance, the biggest take home for people? Uh, for me is that nobody gets off the hook um, and particularly that this needs to be something that's part of the company strategy and discussed at the highest level of decision making within the organization which is the board um, and ultimately um, you know we we in the Olympic Federation want to support um, the Irish team that represent us abroad to be the best they can be um, across all levels whether it's athletes or the coaches or the officials and everybody who's involved in the team everybody who supports the team um, which includes obviously all the governing bodies and the work they do and part of that includes obviously our relations with Sport Ireland and includes you know it's, it's a national effort in order to support athletes to have the best opportunity to perform on the global stage and represent us as well as possible and in order to do that we need to have um, the best of everything involved and the best of everything involved includes um, the right people regardless of their gender. And we need to ensure, therefore, that we factor in uh, ensuring that to get the right people across all of those, that we ensure that we, we look at diversity and gender. And we really also thank everyone for being involved today and generally in this movement, because it's a movement. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Absolutely. And I know there are so many people behind the scenes. One of them is here beside me. Heather Boyle is helping us um, set up everything here. And Mary is online as well. Linda, um, all of the people behind the scenes that have made this series possible. Thank you. And I know um, the whole series is, is supported as well by the Sport Ireland Women in Sport Initiative. So thank you to everybody in Sport Ireland as well who supported it and in the Olympic Federation. Um, we only lost five or six of our participants, probably for three o'clock meetings. So um, fair play it was really engaging. And thank you to Sarah Keane, Sarah O'Shea, uh, Dr. Jennifer Cassidy and Professor Neve Brennan, thank you so much for being with us. Next week is the final in this series and we're going to look at portrayal, um, gender equality in the portrayal of women um, so in sport. So um, join us next week if you can and thanks again for being with us today. Slán